Here's how I record pro sounding vocals at home and how you can too. First off, yes, you do need some equipment, a computer, DAW, mic, interface, headphones, acoustic treatment, etc. I have a whole video on gear you need if you don't know where to start below this video, but wait till after this to watch it. Spoiler. It's not much. The very first thing I do in recording vocals is make sure that my production is mostly or entirely done before recording vocals. This allows me to get the best performance because I'm not performing to a track that still sounds empty or raw. I'm not saying you can't produce vocals with an unfinished track, but that is not the norm in most production processes. And let's face it, vocalists usually perform way better when they have the whole track pumping behind them. Then it's time to track vocals, and I'm gonna show you the six steps to getting a killer vocal. For this video, I'm gonna be using the Black Hole Series 2 mic from my friends over at Jay-Z Mics, which is one of my favorite mics to use on vocals in particular. Oh, and my producer Accelerator members get 50% off the Black Hole mics. So step number one for recording a killer vocal is to make sure that your environment is ideal for recording vocals. You do not want to be recording in a room like this, which is my spare bedroom, nothing on the walls. It sounds like absolute trash and garbage. Now, acoustic treatment is definitely the best option, and the treatment I have in my room helps a tremendous amount. But what I have is rather expensive, and if all you need is a good space to record, and we're not talking about mixing, then use some foam, and it will definitely help reduce ringing and bad reflections. And for those who are like, Nathan, foam doesn't do anything, for mixing, you're a 100% correct, but for recording, you're wrong. Foam is not a good solution for post-production because it won't cut down on low frequencies, but for simply recording, it will help a bad room sound okay. Of course, bass trapping materials is going to work better, but it's also gonna cost significantly more unless you're doing it totally DIY. Once you get that, number two is getting your gain set properly. When you're recording anything, you should not be exceeding minus 60 dB with the fader at zero in your DAW. So if you're recording and the audio looks like this, then that, my friend, is going to sound like crap, and it'll cause a whole lot of problems when it comes time to mix. If your audio is clipping, then you absolutely need to adjust the gain down to prevent that from happening. For my setup, I'm using the Tone Beast preamp by Warm Audio and the Warm Audio 2A compressor right here, which runs into my Antelope audio interface. The preamp and compressor are not required, but having worked without them for years and now having them, it definitely makes a big difference in terms of getting great sounding audio right out of the gate. Side note, if you're just getting started, you don't need analog gear right now. Focus on the basics and you can always upgrade. When you're recording your vocals, often different sections in the song are going to have different volume levels. So you need to be constantly keeping an eye on your levels throughout, and you'll very likely need to adjust the gain while you are recording, whether that's on your interface or on your preamp, which is one of the benefits of actually using an analog compressor. It becomes a lot easier to manage this. You're not doing this when you're actually recording a take, but from section to section. So verse one might need a bit more gain than the chorus, for example, and the big shouty bridge might need less gain because it's really loud. Basically, keep an eye on if you're getting too hot, and if you are, then you need to dial it back a bit. So in terms of volume, your target is no higher than minus 6 dB and no lower than minus 18 dB. That gives you a lot of room to work with. If in doubt, err on the quiet side, not loud, especially if you're just getting started. Number three is the distance you are from the mic. Too close to the mic and it sounds woofy and insanely bassy. And too far away and it sounds thin, lacks depth, also picks up more room noise. So you need to discover what works best for your mic. Every mic will respond differently to audio. The black hole mic here is incredibly sensitive, so if I'm, you know, a foot away, it'll still capture a very nice and rich sound. But my other favorite is this guy right here, the Loudon Audio LS208, which you have to get nice and close to in order to capture the best tone. So experiment different spacing from the mic. And if you want that intimate feeling, then closer will get you that almost Billie Eilish sound. We have to be very careful with this because it can cause a lot of problems, especially in the low mids and in terms of Plosives. And speaking of plosives, please make sure that you have a pop filter. They're cheap and you can buy them on Sweetwater. I'll link all the gear I talk about in the description. For me, I tend to stand between 6 and 12 inches away from the mic, again, depending on the mic. And number four, now that you have your gain set up right and you're a good distance from the mic, it's time to get a solid performance. And for some insane reason, so many producers get super lazy with us. Like, why wouldn't you put a ton of effort into nailing the performance? I see this all the time that vocals are tracked and attention to detail completely went out the window during the recording session. You want pro vocals? Then put in pro effort on the performance. And don't be saying, oh, I can edit that, or oh, I can slap auto-tune on that. That is the mentality of amateur producers. Trust me, the pros are not doing this. The three big things I listen for in a vocal session are, one, nailing the rhythm. Rhythm is insanely important. If the rhythm is off, then I will redo the take every single time. And if I'm coaching a singer, I will always coach them to nail 
the rhythm because it is that important. Rhythm is one of the biggest and most noticeable mistakes a musician can make. More often than not, vocalists have a tendency to rush the rhythm. So I'm coaching them to make sure that they sit back and stay relaxed during the session. Sometimes I will change the volume of the metronome or even the tone of the metronome so they can really hear it well. Two, emotion. You have to perform with the right emotion of the song. If you're not performing the emotion of the song, then the performance is not going to feel right. Is the song happy? Is it sad? Thoughtful? Does it require intimacy and restraint or power and grit? See, those are the big things that I'm working to pull out of a vocalist in a recording session. My goal is to get them to sing the emotion of the song. And three, yes, pitch. I want the pitch to be right, but pitch falls much lower on the level of importance because it is easy to fix. And if the rhythm and emotion are spot on, then a pitchy performance is actually really easy to work with if you know what you're doing. And I am not advocating for poor pitchy performances. I'm just saying it's not the most important thing in my opinion out of these three but it's still in the top three. I usually will try to aim for less than 10 takes per section. And if it's taking more than 10 takes, it probably means there needs to be more practice done. And it's worth either moving on to a new section or taking a break to just practice for a bit. Get a solid number of takes so you can easily find the best performances for comping. Number five, adding vocal layers and harmonies. Vocal production is arguably one of the most important aspects in a production. Yes, sometimes you want very simple production with just one vocal, but in most of the music that I'm producing, I have a lot of vocal layers. Every single time I close my eyes, it takes me right back to where I started now. And it makes a huge difference. I often track doubles of the lead, octaves up, octaves down, and then of course harmonies. But don't just track harmonies for the sake of harmonies. Be strategic in where you place them so you can create the most intriguing arrangement possible. To me, this is where the pros separate from the pack in recording vocals. They layer up their vocals creatively and with serious levels of intentionality and creativity. Now, I'm not saying that you have to always layer up every single song. Of course not. Be intentional and think through what your purpose is. If it doesn't call for it, then don't do it. In my single coming back in verse two, I'm utilizing doubles in and out so they almost weave along the lead vocals like this. It's like going back home. Back to where I belong It's like seeing a friend Wishing it'll never end It still feels like home But not like it used to Trust me, if I just had a lead and didn't add any vocal layers, that verse would be way less interesting to listen to. When you are doubling vocals, make sure you're panning them to really make this sound the best. If you don't pan a doubled vocal, it will usually just sound a bit weird. So when I'm tracking vocals, I'll do one main lead in the middle and then two doubles panned, one hard right and one hard left. And I do this same technique for octaves and even harmonies. If you're not utilizing panning, it's not gonna sound as good. I have a whole video I'll share on this a little bit later. And number six, it's time to comp and edit your vocals. Again, this is what the pros do. Take your time and go through the take folders to put together the best comp possible. This means you could potentially be compiling phrase by phrase to get the best possible vocal to work with, but it is so, so worth doing. I only comp on phrases and not individual words. I found it very very hard to comp word by word because it won't sound as natural. So this is why getting a solid performance is key because it makes this process so much easier. Sometimes I hardly have to comp a vocal at all if it was done super well during the session and that should be the goal. And then once you comp, it's time to edit. Remove audio that's silent and add fades at the beginning and end of all audio regions. This prevents unwanted noise when there's no sound for the vocal and adding fades at the beginning and end of every region prevents any pops or clicks on those in and out points. Then edit your vocal layers to to the lead so that everything is super, super tight. And that is absolutely essential to get a super high quality production. You can do this manually like I do, or there's software like Vocaline, which can do it for you. I personally just prefer having more control over it. And then it's time for pitch correction. I use a combo of Autotune Pro and Flex Pitch and Logic, but any pitch software that allows for graphic editing is what you'll want to use. I used just Flex Pitch for the longest time and it works great. Others use Melodyne and some even use plugins like Waves Tune, which I've used before and it works. The specific software software matters way less than really knowing how to use it. The key is to not overdo it. Do not edit the life out of your vocals. It's about nudging and making the moments that are really noticeable fixed and not about making this lifeless performance. I am not a fan of the auto-tune warble, so I don't edit that hard, but I do edit with a keen eye for detail. I have an entire playlist right here that goes into detail on basically everything I've talked about in this video. Talk soon.